Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Ateneo de Manila Department of Economics and Ateneo Center for Economic Research and Development Seminar Series. So we hold this seminar series um, twice a month, every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. And we invite um, economists to share their most recent um, research to share with us. Okay, so before I introduce our speaker for this morning, um, let me just remind you of our house rules. We will let the speaker finish his presentation first before we entertain questions. Zoom participants, kindly stay muted and stop sharing your video during the duration of the presentation. During Q&A, please virtually raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. Please introduce yourself when you unmute and show yourself when asking your question. Participants on Facebook, Please post your questions in the comment sections. We will prioritize asking the questions with the most number of likes in, in case we have so many questions. Uh, we apologize in case we are not able to read them all due to limited time. Okay, our speaker this, after, this morning is a senior lecture, lecturer at the School of Business of the University of Wollongong in Australia. He was previously a researcher in the Division of Labor Markets, Education, and Population of the RWI, Leibniz Institute for Economic, Economic Research in Essen, Germany. His research interest is in the empirical analysis of issues related to human capital, particularly in the fields of labor, health, and education economics. His previous works have been published in, among others, the European Economic Review, Economics of Education Review, and Oxford Economic Papers. He received his BA and MA in Economics from the UP School of Economics, his MA in Law and Economics with the highest distinction jointly awarded by the Erasmus University of Rotterdam in Netherlands, the University of Hamburg in Germany, and the University of Bologna in Italy. And PhD in Economics, summa cum laude, from the Ruhr University of Bochum in Germany. Without um, further ado, um, let's have Dr. Alfredo R. Paloyo to present his seminar on active learning and academic performance. Paloyo, the screen is yours. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, Maha. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Maha and, and the organizers at uh, the Ateneo Department of Economics uh, for inviting me to, to the seminar and to present. I noted that uh, Alvin Ang just entered the, the room. Uh, and Alvin and I were actually together in, I think it was Hong Kong or Singapore for a Ronald Post Institute many, many years ago when we were younger. Um, so good to see you, Alvin. I'll share the screen now for, uh, for the presentation. Um, let's see if this works. It's always like suspense, right? We're not sure whether these things will work, um, but we'll do our best. Uh, let me move this to the other side. There you go. Can everybody see that? Just give me some, like a raise your hand if it's fine. Not yet. Not yet? That's yeah. not good. Oh, let's see. Okay. How about that one? Yes. Okay, now. That's fine. Cool. Yes. Uh, so that's good. So this is a joint work with some of my colleagues here at uh, the University of Wollongong, um, Dr. Amir Arjamandi and uh, Professor Sandy Swardi. Um, and what we're looking at here is um, a pedagogical technique uh, generally within the field of like active learning. Uh, so most of the people here would have gone to the university and you had lectures when you were undergrads and indeed you've delivered lectures for, for some of you. Um, and there are different ways of delivering lectures. Um, what is on vogue uh, lately has been to deliver lectures in an active way where students are actively participating instead of the more traditional, if you will, model of, um, of delivering the lecture where there is a, what is called a sage on the stage model, where there is a lecturer or a professor standing in front of the students um, and then just passively giving out information to the students. And that's kind of um, what we're looking at here, um, in particular, an active learning technique, which is uh, the case of real-time uh, student polling. So you give out uh, these multiple choice questions uh, during the lecture or during the tutorial, and students can answer uh, these questions uh, on their devices, either on their computers or uh, their, their phones. Um, and then, you know, the lecturer can kind of keep track of, uh, of the comprehension of, of the students uh, for the subject matter. As you can tell, 
you know, when we did this study, it was uh, pre pre COVID. Uh, <laughs> obviously, now uh, student engagement um, is a little bit down because everybody is teaching online, and that's kind of um, a problem. So it may not be uh, entirely relevant for uh, for the COVID uh, situation that we find ourselves in today. But hopefully, in the future, when we've you know transitioned back to normality, we'll have uh, some some real world applications of of the things that we do here. Um, so first of all, I mean, I know it's, you know, Ateneo that has invited me, but this research was conducted at the University of Wollongong and where I am presenting from at the moment uh, is here on campus at the University of Wollongong. And um, because of this, I would like to first of all acknowledge uh, the traditional uh, custodians of the land on which the University of Wollongong is situated. And I would like to pay uh, my respects to Aboriginal elders, past, present, and those who have yet to emerge who are the knowledge holders and teachers. I would also like to acknowledge their continued spiritual uh, and cultural connection to the country. From different eras in uh, human history, uh, the first one is like you can tell really, really old. Um, the second one in the upper right is fairly recent. Um, and then of course, uh, the bottom picture is a, a picture of a modern lecture hall that you will find in in most universities. And all of these places are where lectures have taken place. And irrespective of the time period in human history, if I took a student from today and put it in the top left photo there, the student will know exactly where to sit, right? Um, there will be a lecturer there, uh, if you want, like a philosopher there um, and conducting uh, a class, right? The same is true for, for the upper right photo. And so what this tells us is that the model of, of lecturing hasn't really evolved too much from the way it has been originally delivered. Um, maybe because it's a good thing to do, right? Maybe if there's nothing wrong with it, we don't fix it. Um, but also maybe because people don't want to innovate uh, in their teaching. So I note, of course, that there are a few faculty members attending uh, today's seminar. Um, and I would ask, you know, uh, you to ask yourselves, you know, when was the last time I innovated in my teaching? When was the last time I incorporated technology into my teaching? Uh, when was the last time I moved away from uh, the chalk and talk method of, you know, I have a chalk, I have a blackboard that I can write on, and, you know, students are there eagerly uh, listening to me. Um, but in fact, in the education space, a lot of innovation has, uh, has taken place. And all this because, of course, we're doing a lot more research in how students are, are learning. Uh, we're taking into account uh, different um, diversity issues that students might face. So I remember, you know, when I was in the Philippines, um, well, maybe I should say, for example, here in, at the University of Wollongong, we give a lot of what we call academic consideration to students. You know, maybe they don't feel very well that day and they can't take the exam. That's okay, we'll give you a supplementary exam. Um, or students who are, uh, you know, their mental well-being is not at the top of their game. I mean, there is a pandemic after all, so we take that into account. We may give them special considerations. Uh, students that are coming from regional areas are also, um, you know, very well taken care of. Um, we make all of those adjustments. And, you know, going back to where I was in the Philippines, I remember a professor used to tell me, you know, the only excuse that he will accept is a death certificate. Right, <laughs> which is kind of a little bit extreme, right? Um, but now we have a lot of these uh, uh, accommodations um, because we are, uh, in a sense, moving towards a model where learning is student-centered. Um, the the king of the show, is, or the queen, if you want, it was just after all International Women's Day, uh, of the show is not so much the lecturer standing in front of the student, right? But the student must be an active participant in the generation of knowledge within the classroom, right? And the model of uh, a lecturer in front of students is kind of passe in a sense. Um, we're moving away for, from that model. That said, um, you know, there is a place for a lecturer, I think. So I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, lecturers that don't adjust their uh, practices. But, you know, it's something to, to think about, at least. Uh, so there is this one quote here. College is a place where professors' lectures no, uh, lecture notes go straight to the students' lecture notes without passing through the brains of, of either, right? <laughs> uh, you have, you know, the material that you need to deliver to the students. You deliver the material and off you go. And then there will be an exam at some point. 
uh, and that's kind of uh, not where we uh, where we want to be. I hope. Um, so there are advances um, within the literature and even in within uh, practitioners. There are calls for for reform, and, and these calls are quite widespread. Um, but of course, in line with this, we want to be able to provide um, evidence for uh, our teaching practices. Okay. Um, it's nice to say, oh, you know, students like short videos because they're used to TikTok videos these days, which are, you know, maybe two minutes long or something. Um, but we need evidence for that, right? We need evidence that it translates to uh, student outcomes that we care about. Uh, maybe we want to see whether it improves their learning. Maybe you want to see whether it improves their attention span. Or maybe indeed, you know, it affects their uh, satisfaction with, with the subject, um, with the teacher and with the university. Uh, a lot of these advances are made possible by uh, technology. So technology is a, a key player in, in this space. Uh, a lot of the things that um, uh, we are able to do now would not have been possible without the use of, uh, without the assistance of a modern technology. And then of course, this transition towards uh, active learning uh, versus passive learning. Right? We want students to be engaged with the material. We want them to be talking to each other. We want them to be uh, engaging with the lecturer. We want them to be engaging with the material outside what is uh, simply delivered uh, within each other. They're allowed to work on problems together. Um, and you don't even see the lecturer here in this case, right? Um, the lecturer is somewhere there in the background, just facilitating things. So you might imagine this might be a situation where the classroom has been so-called flipped where you know you give the lecture materials and uh, uh, the, the lecturer's role is simply to uh, facilitate uh, a tutorial class. Okay? And that's kind of uh, the model that we want to transition to. It may not be, of course, the model that uh, Ateneo would want to transition to, but uh, many places around the world have now put in place uh, policies to transition to something uh, that, looks like, uh, that looks like this. Okay. So we did an experiment because we need evidence, right? So uh, first of all, where did we do the experiment? Um, well, we did it here at my university, the University of Wulungong. And just to give you some idea about uh, where I teach, we have about 27,000 onshore uh, students here uh, in Wulungong. Um, and then we have, of course, our offshore campuses in Dubai, Malaysia, uh, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and some other places. So we have a total of about 34,000. Uh, students. It's probably less now because of uh, online learning. Um, students have kind of decided to delay uh, enrollment, but you know, in general, pre-pandemic, uh, we are about 27,000 onshore students, and we do quite well uh, in terms of our uh, teaching. We're quite proud, actually, of uh, uh, the, how students are satisfied with teaching at uh, the University of Wollongong. We're a top performer in these two categories called learner engagement and uh, learning resources. Among others, this is from uh, Quilt. That's a federal, uh, so in, in the Philippine context, a national uh, survey of, uh, of higher education institutions. They survey students that graduate from, uh, from higher education institutions and uh, see how students uh, would rate the universities uh, that they graduated from. Within uh, the state and territory of New South Wales and the Australian capital territory, so that's where Canberra is, we're the highest overall. Uh, and in the field of uh, business education, we are also the highest in New South Wales and um, the ACT. Okay? So we do very well in, in teaching. Students are quite happy uh, with, with our teaching here at UOW. This particular subject that we trialed this uh, pedagogical approach is called Statistics for Business or COM 121, Commerce 101, uh, 121. Um, and it's about 500 students per, per semester. Again, uh, pre-pandemic, I'm not sure what the numbers are um, these days, but about uh, 500 students per semester. And the way we deliver our uh, semesters here is over 13 weeks. Um, and then there's a, a mid-week, uh, mid-semester break of, of one week. Um, and as is typical, I think for large classes, this is probably true for Ateneo as well. It was certainly true for, for UP when I was there. Uh, you have a large uh, lecture, so where you have the, the professor or the lecturer in front of the students delivering uh, a very large uh, lecture between, you know, here in this case, about 500 students, but some of our classes are over 1,000 students. And then you break that up into uh, smaller, what are called uh, tutorial classes uh, in our uh, setting here. Um, and these are about 15 to 25 students. 
some of our subjects uh, are also uh, supplemented by what is called a peer assisted study program, or in other contexts, it's called SI or supplementary instruction. These are uh, small groups that are led by students themselves who have previously graduated, uh, sorry, previously passed uh, and excelled in, in that subject. Uh, and it's peer assisted, so meaning these are students that are leading um, these, uh, these classes, whereas the lecture, it's, it's the professor or the lecturer, and the smaller tutorial classes are also sometimes the professor lectures, but uh, in more cases, um, the not would be like tutors that we've that we've hired. Um, just relatedly, we've already evaluated this past program for the University of Wollongong, so that's already published in the Economics of Education Review with uh, my former colleague Thali Rogan and uh, and Peter Sivinsky. Um, and we find um, that it does uh, have a little bit of an effect, but uh, only for uh, for first year students. Okay, if you're interested in that, we can talk about it uh, after the seminar. Right, so what do we talk about in statistics for business as would be typical in, in the first year subject of statistics, we cover uh, probability theory and then we do uh, inference. And then uh, because it is a commerce subject, so it's not just economists taking these subjects, we also have ANOVA and uh, towards the end, a little bit of uh, regression analysis. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, we need evidence. So the best way to generate evidence is to run an experiment. Um, so, I mean, I take the note of the fact that uh, a previous uh, seminar speaker of yours ran an experiment on uh, labels for air conditioners or something. So we also kind of do the same thing for education research. We run an experiment in this case. Um, we, because it's involving humans, we file for uh, ethics approval from our institutional review board, the Human Research Ethics Committee. And of course, we've been approved. <laughs> We didn't run the experiment without the uh, ethics approval. Uh, and when was this? Oh gosh, that's, that's a long time ago, <laughs> looking back. Um, 2017 uh, in spring. So spring in Australia is about the second half of the year uh, for, for this subject, come on to one statistics for business. And our sample is about a little bit over 500 students uh, with, uh, with declared marks. So they've already completed um, that subject. So how do we do it? Well, we divide the uh, tutorial classes because remember, you know, the lecture is huge, right? And then we split that up into smaller tutorial classes. So we kind of just uh, randomly select about nine of those tutorial classes to be administered the, the treatment, okay? And I'll speak a little bit more about what that treatment is in the next slide or so, but uh, nine tutorial classes would be in the treatment group and the residual would be um, the, uh, the control section. And then, you know, just to um, declare our funding, the faculty provided um, some money to purchase uh, the software that we used to facilitate um, what we wanted to do here. All right, so what did we do? Well, we used a particular commercial software actually um, called Learning Catalytics. Uh, so that's a technology enabled system for, for, for classroom uh, response. If you're not familiar, these are what are called like the clicker questions where in, you know, in the old days, I mean, when, they, when I say the old days, maybe about like eight years ago or something, uh, they had, students had these like little clickers that they had, which operate wirelessly and the lecturer would ask a question and then they would, you know, kind of answer on their little clickers and the lecturer gets feedback uh, real time. Uh, but anyway, Learning Catalytics is um, software that was developed at Harvard, um, but it's now owned by this uh, publishing company called Pearson. Um, some of our textbooks that we use are, are from Pearson. Um, and it's kind of, it's a software that facilitates active learning. It's got a lot of features. Um, and I think the best way I can show you is just, I'll show you a kind of like a video about it. Um, and let me just um, optimize the sharing for a video clip and then put this over there. Um, can you see the, the YouTube screen? Is that a yes or no? Yes. Cool. So I'll play that here. Learning Catalytics gives every student a voice. Engage students by posing a variety of unique question types that help them recall ideas, apply concepts, and develop critical thinking skills. Your students then respond using their own smartphones, tablets, or laptops. Without saying a word, students are able to tell you when they do and don't understand. You can monitor student responses with real-time analytics and find out where they're struggling. 
Using this information, you're able to adjust your teaching accordingly, facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning, and address student misconceptions the moment they occur. With Learning Catalytics, you'll hear from every student when it matters. Get started at learningcatalytics.com. Okay. Am I back on the slides there? Yes. Like you're seeing. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's like the... So it's a uh, pleasure for me to introduce you to oh, Laura sure. Patsko. Sorry. I'm sure you already know her because she delivered... There we go. That was my YouTube playing. <laughs> okay. Um, there we go. So, so that's, you know, it's a bring your own device type of situation. Um, the student doesn't really need to... Um, purchase anything new if they have a cell phone that has some internet connectivity they can use it um, and then you know i don't need to show it but if you know justin wolfers he's a, he's a professor at the university of michigan and he's like famous for using the clicker questions and if you click on that link um, i'm sure the slides will at some point be provided to, to everyone here but if you click on that link it's just a video a short snippet of him like totally surprised that all his students got the questions 100 percent. so it was just a funny funny clip anyway so that's um, what the software is. Um, and what we do here in our particular case, as you can tell, the software is like quite powerful. There are a lot of things that you can do with the software. Uh, we use only one particular aspect of it, uh, and that is to be able to do what is called like real-time uh, polling or real-time quizzes. Um, so what happens is um, once these students are broken up into their tutorial classes, uh, they come in and at the start of the tutorial class, the tutor uh, shows them these uh, sets of questions at the start, you know, usually multiple choice questions um, and students respond to it. And immediately uh, the tutor is uh, aware of where the students' difficulties um, lie, right? Because typically, you know, you have your lecture, um, you know, that's the lecture delivered by the professor. And then the following week, you have your tutorial classes. And in this following week, the tutor can kind of test whether the students uh, followed the material that the professor delivered the previous week. Uh, so in that sense, the feedback is instant. Um, and immediately the tutor can see you know, like where the problem areas are, who uh, are, uh, which students are having trouble um, and so on, right? So the remaining time after you know, being given or being that information being discovered by the, the tutor, the remaining time is spent on the usual uh, weekly problem sets that, uh, that are assigned to the students. Um, and in the treatment classes or in the treatment tutorial sections, um, the, uh, the tutor kind of adjusts the teaching to accommodate whatever uh, results came out of, of the polling at the start of the class. In the control classes, um, this does not happen. They simply go into the uh, tutorial class they don't get this multiple choice question at the start and they just simply go right into uh, the problem sets. Okay, so that's that. Um, if there are any clarifying questions, just, just let me know. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll take it at the end. Um, just some descriptive statistics. Um, the, the students you know, are kind of, I mean, I would say young relative to me. <laughs> um, they're about 20 years old. Um, the, we have you know, some more uh, international students in the control group than there are in, in the treated group. We have a Dean Scholars program. Um, and here we have the number of previously completed subjects. Um, so even though these are first year students, uh, maybe, well, most of them are first year students. Uh, some of these students enrolled in these classes uh, may have been in the university for a little bit longer than uh, their first years. Uh, we control for um, whether they have previously uh, failed the subject. Um, and, you know, the typical class size, the tutorial class size is about 21 uh, students, right? So there are more uh, controls, uh, control observations than there are in the treatment because, of course, we only treated nine of the uh, 24 um, classes. Um, and here, I mean, because we randomize the delivery of the treatment, we have to kind of be sure that the uh, the, the samples are balanced between the treatment and the control. And so we test the difference of these means uh, between the control group and the, uh, uh, the treatment group here. And this is uh, the difference. Um, and you can see that uh, there is some imbalance in, in, in the share of international students, but we control for that. So that's not uh, too big of a deal. Um, 
how do we kind of address or to make it a little bit better? Um, well, we can we can make it a little bit more balanced and um, only estimate over what is called the common support. Um, I'll talk about that in a little while. But anyway, we can just model the probability of being treated for each student, okay, and then calculate what is called the uh, propensity score. So if you're familiar with um, a little bit of econometrics, so essentially you have a treatment status on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side are your uh, covariates or your control variables. Um, and then you kind of just run this uh, as a probit, uh, or if you want a linear probability model, and then you calculate the predicted values, that's your propensity to being treated. And then you calculate that for um, separately for the treatment and control groups. So this, is the distribution of the propensity to be treated from the uh, learning catalytics or the treatment group. That's the maroon-ish line. I mean, I picked maroon because of course my undergrad is from UP, but I also picked blue because I'm presenting in Ateneo, right? Uh, so this is the uh, kernel density distribution of the, the control group, the blue one. Um, and you can see there is a region here where there is no overlap. Uh, so we just kind of get rid of these observations where there is no overlap on either side of uh, of the distribution. Uh, so you do that, you end up with what is called, you know, uh, observations that lie within the common support, right? And when we say it lies, uh, uh, they lie within the common support, it just means that if I pick a treated uh, student, that, that there is a comparable untreated student uh, on, on the other side, right? Whereas here, you know, they, these are, for example, uh, controlled students and they don't have any comparison uh, treated students here. Or on this other side here, there are these treated students and they don't have any comparison. Um, control students. So we just kind of like restrict our estimation over um, the common support, although our results are uh, robust uh, to even including uh, these uh, observations here that are uh, that lie outside the common support. Uh, okay, but when you do that, when you restrict the sample to just within the common support, you kind of get rid of the problem with the international students. So now everything is uh, is balanced and you don't lose too many observations anyway. I think you lose maybe eight observations, is that right? Yeah, about just eight observations. It's no big deal, really. Okay, so that's the experiment. That's how we did it, and it's balanced. Now we can, you know, the good thing about experiments is that uh, once you design a good experiment, really you just need a, a regression <laughs> to look to analyze the results. Um, and here we are looking at uh, four uh, particular outcomes. Actually, just three. One is just standardized. Um, so we have the final mark. Um, so that's. Uh, the grade, so uh, 75, 76, whatever. Um, and then we standardize that. Um, and then we also look at, um, as a measure of student engagement, we look at uh, tutorial attendance. And then we also look at uh, failure probability. This uh, variable here is our treatment indicator, whether they are in the treatment group or not. So whether they receive the learning catalytics instruction or not. And these are estimates of the coefficient on this treatment indicator. Uh, this row here gives you uh, the mean values uh, for these variables in the control group. And that's there to give you an idea of, of the magnitude of, of, of these coefficients. Uh, and then that's the observation uh, numbers. Fair enough. Um, the first three are estimated um, as a linear model. And here, uh, this is a nonlinear model. It's just a probit. And then we report marginal effects. Um, the only other thing that's kind of like uh, notable here is that the, the numbers here in parentheses are, um, I think, heteroscedasticity uh, robust standard errors, and the ones in, in brackets are uh, clustered at the classroom level. So we allow for clustering uh, to account for uh, spillover effects within a particular uh, classroom, um, but it doesn't really matter too much uh, for the estimates of the, of the standard errors, right? As you can tell, you know, um, yeah, they're quite close to each other. Now, that said, what do we find? Uh, well, nothing is going on with uh, final marks, right? So it doesn't seem to be affecting uh, final marks. Um, and let's move on to the other null result, which is that it also doesn't impact um, failure probability, right? So students, uh, whether they receive learning catalytics instruction, in particular real-time polling or not, don't seem to be uh, affected um, or their failure probability is unaffected. Neither uh, are their uh, marks uh, affected. Where it kind of kicks in is uh, their engagement, which in this case, we're looking at um, their tutorial attendance, okay? Um, and so tutorial attendance increases by about 1.6, uh, 
um, hours uh, to each tutorial class is uh, about one hour. So tutorial attendance increases by 1.6 hours. Um, and this is the mean uh, tutorial attendance for, for, for those students in the untreated group, right? So that's not an insubstantial increase in uh, tutorial attendance. Uh, so that's the estimates without uh, controls. So literally just an indicator for whether they were treated or not. And, you know, you kind of make the estimates a little bit better by adding uh, controls in there. And those are our variables that I showed you in the descriptive tables. Uh, I include age, number of previously completed subjects, tutorial class size, and indicators for being an international student, uh, being a Dean Scholar, and an indicator for having previously failed uh, the subject and the results carry over um, as you would expect, right? Uh, you are probably run into trouble if your uh, estimates uh, change between having controls and uh, no controls in an experiment. Um, so, you know, no impacts on final marks, um, nothing happening with uh, failure probability and tutorial attendance, you know, goes up by in this case 1.5 ish. Um, so a little bit less than the uh, estimate without controls, but still, you know, roughly about um, the same. So it seems to be the case that um, the kind of um, active learning approach that we tested here, which is real-time um, student polling, doesn't really affect final marks too much, or at all, in fact, um, doesn't really influence the failure probability of, of the student. However, uh, if you consider tutorial attendance as a proxy for student engagement, then you can say it increases student engagement uh, by quite a bit. Um, and these are just graphical representations of, of this table here. Um, this is the, the final marks and you know they're kind of roughly the same, right? So there is no influence on, on final marks. However, uh, here is um, tutorial attendance the blue ones, again, um, are uh, the control uh, observations and the red ones would be the, uh, the treated observations. And what this graph shows you is that essentially what the treatment is doing is moving uh, students onto more tutorial classes such that they attend about 10 tutorial classes um, per semester. And in our case, the maximum number of tutorial classes is 11 even though we have 12, uh, 13 weeks of lectures, our tutorial classes, uh, there are only 11 per semester. So we're moving quite a bunch of students onto the, the top range of, of that. So students are more and more attending uh, the tutorial classes because of uh, the provision of learning catalytics. All right, so those are the results. Now we can kind of like talk about it and uh, I would appreciate it if you have some ideas regarding how to interpret it. But um, that being said, learning catalytics, um, has been evaluated in other disciplines as well. So if you search the literature on learning catalytics in keywords, uh, in quotation marks, um, you know, they've looked at it in chemistry, dentistry, in engineering, and so on. The tricky part here is making cross-study comparisons because the learning catalytic software has a lot of features. Um, and so you have to be very clear about which aspect of the software they are uh, testing here. So, you know, maybe they don't use real-time polling. Um, one very interesting uh, feature of learning catalytics is if you have a seating plan and you can kind of have a question to the students and you can see where they're seated in your little device. Uh, and then you can see which students got the question right or wrong. And then learning catalytics can automatically sort the students into pairs. So one student gets the correct answer and the other student who didn't get the correct answer can pair and then they can do what is called think, pair, and share and then have a discussion and then that maybe improves learning. Um, so those are features of the software that we didn't test here, but you can test if you wanted to. Um, there are a couple of studies where, you know, they show you a positive impact on, on final marks, mostly from, from the developers of, of the software. So, you know, um, the one that kind of applies it to economics is this one um, uh, study called uh, from Woodward. I mean, it's okay. It's correlated with a 19% increase in uh, student engagement. Now, whether that's causal is an altogether uh, different question. Uh, more generally, if you uh, flip the classroom, uh, so this pedagogical technique of flipping the classroom, 
Um, one economist, Elizabeth Cetrin, um, has looked at it uh, at West Point or the U.S. Military Academy, and she shows you know there is a uh, 0.33 uh, uh, gain in standard uh, standard deviation gain in in mathematics, no impact on on economics. So the, you know it's a rich field of study. And there's a lot of things that you can kind of do in this area, um, and that's this is our uh, contribution to it. Um, right. So just to summarize, uh, this must be your fastest seminar presenter ever, but just to summarize, uh, what we did here is to run a randomized controlled trial to look at the impact of real-time quizzes um, on, on student outcomes, um, in particular, uh, final marks, um, tutorial attendance, so student engagement, um, and uh, failure probability. Doesn't seem to be the case that it has anything uh, to do with final marks or failure probability, but it does increase uh, student attendance or um, tutorial attendance, student engagement by about 1.5 uh, classes. And that's 22% of um, the, the mean for, for the control group, right? So that's, that's a substantial increase in, in student engagement. Um, and this is one feedback from the student um, that they kind of, they like uh, learning catalytics. Okay, so there are a few limitations to the study. Um, one is that maybe you don't find an effect because this is the first time we're using it, right? And so certainly, you know, the software is complicated. There's some, there's a steep learning curve to, to using uh, the learning catalytic software. And maybe the tutors were not using it uh, as, as effectively as they could have, right? Um, the other thing is that we, only tested um, real-time polling, right? So it's not like we tested the entire suite of features that the software uh, provides. And that's also, you know, something that we can, we can talk about. And then of course, you know, as is common for, uh, for experiments, uh, we did this a, at a very specific uh, context, which is uh, my university here, uh, the University of Wollongong, um, whether it applies to other contexts, uh, different distribution of students and so on, um, is also an interesting question that we may or may not be able to, uh, to answer. I'll leave you with this. Uh, and it's kind of, I've met a lot of lecturers who are quite resistant to change, right? Because they feel that they are the experts in whatever it is that they're teaching and they have nothing to learn from, from other teachers, right? So when we go into the classroom, let me read it out to you. When you go into the classroom to teach, we assume that nothing more than our expert knowledge of the discipline and our accumulated experiences as students and teachers are required to be a competent teacher. But as I'm sure if there are any students here uh, in, in the seminar right now can tell you, there is a wide, wide distribution of teacher quality. <laughs> uh, some are really effective teachers. Um, and some are, let's say, could have room for improvement, right? Um, what is important is that when we make innovations in our teaching, um, that there is a credible evaluation component um, uh, to these changes. That way we can say something uh, about the efficacy of our uh, pedagogical methods. So in this case, you know, if somebody tells you, well, you know, I'd like to try... Uh, multiple choice questions at the start of the class to see where students are at, well, it's going to probably increase uh, student engagement, but, you know, maybe not so much um, final marks. Um, and one uh, final thing that's very important, uh, like this is really important, you should pay attention. It was recently Maha's birthday, so I would like to greet her a very belated happy birthday. And with that, I can end my presentation. Salama. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Paloyo. So please, uh, let's give um, Paloy a virtual applause before we do the Q&A. Okay, uh, this is very actually interesting and also very relevant, na? especially right now that we are doing these online classes due to the pandemic. Okay, so at this point, we can entertain questions, uh, both from Facebook and also from um, our Zoom participants. So you may unmute and show yourself when you ask your question. Um, please also introduce yourself, um, your uh, institutional affiliation. So anybody who would like to start?
anybody, let me just scroll my screen. You're very popular, Palois. We have about um, 20 plus on Facebook and 30 plus here on Zoom. Yes, I basically bribed everybody I know. <laughs> okay, uh, we have questions from Carl and then Jeff. Uh, Carl, you may go ahead. Hi, Professor Paloyo. Nice to see you. Uh, I'm Carl from UP School of Economics. So, Palois, I'm curious about uh, your, your results or lack of it. Uh, I mean, lack of statistically significant results. Can you, can you say something about like class schedules, how you schedule the classes for the, le the it, it, what do you call it? Is it a class or a tutorial? Like a tutorial class? A tutorial class for the treatment and control groups. Because I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by this literature on circadian rhythm that, that so, some people think that, you know, morning classes are best for learning and stuff or, or, Probably there's some kind of self-selection going to like early or late afternoon classes. I don't know like the culture of the students there, but uh, did this in any way affect your results or like the, the, the lack of significant uh, results? Right. So that's a, that's a good point, actually. Um, we assume an expectation that they're going to be balanced, right? However... Um, the thing is, students enroll in, in the tutorial class, but whether or not that particular tutorial class, uh, whether there's a higher likelihood for a tutorial class to be treated in the morning than in the afternoon is in expectation the same, right? Because the distribution of the treatment is randomized. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, there are only 24 of them, uh, mm -hmm. these tutorial classes. So it might have been the case that some of them uh, that the the, uh, the treated classes were a little bit more morning dominant versus the, the afternoon mm -hmm. dominant. We didn't actually check for for that, but that's uh, that's interesting. Uh, but also because um, maybe self motivated or very motivated students would tend to enroll in in morning classes, um, yeah. and they're the ones that are really fast in enrollment. Most of these tutorial classes are oversubscribed, so at some point, you know, it's kind of random after a certain cutoff. But um, the eager beaver ones may self-select into better scheduled uh, tutorial mm -hmm. classes. Uh, so you're right. I mean, those are yeah, threats to internal validity, if you want, um, mm -hmm. that we can potentially uh, check if we go back to the original timetable. But yeah, that's, you're right. Thank you, Palo. It's brilliant as usual. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I swear, <laughs> I did not pay Carl. I did not send an email beforehand. He just said that spontaneously. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeff? And thanks, Paloy, thanks, Paloy, for the very uh, interesting and very relevant presentation. Um, active polling is obviously something that's highly relevant now. And in fact, it's done for online classes. Uh, offhand, um, how do you think the results would, could differ uh, in the case of online uh, teaching, the, the, the impact of uh, active polling. And if you are going to design uh, uh, a similar study for online uh, classes, if you're not already doing it, how would you design it differently? Or would, would, would there be a difference? I mean, it's a, it's a very relevant question. Um, I was just talking to Maha before the seminar that, you know, Ateneo has, of course, transitioned to online teaching. We have also transitioned to online teaching here. The experiment that we conducted was in a context where uh, we didn't have to do online teaching. But now I think um, my, I mean, I didn't do the study, obviously, but like my guess is active learning now in an online type of environment is certainly going to be a better uh, situation for if you didn't do anything if you just had a narrated powerpoint that's going to absolutely suck across multiple dimensions of student learning right now of course we make a distinction between um, final marks and other aspects of student life that we might be concerned about right but i think you know ateneo as an institution and i say ateneo because you know i'm talking to atenistas here um, I think people in Ateneo would care about uh, student satisfaction, right? Um, if you have a lecturer that's kind of like resistant to change, and this lecturer's idea of a lecture is to have a PowerPoint and record audio for each of those slides and then just deliver that to the student, 
I mean, I can guarantee you the students are going to be like, what the F, right? Um, as opposed to a lecturer who's a little bit more um, innovative in teaching, acknowledging that the environment has changed and therefore pedagogy must adapt, I think will generate much better student outcomes. Perhaps it's a different question whether it translates to better learning or something else, but at least at its most basic level of student satisfaction, I can almost guarantee and that they will be uh, happier customers than they would be if you just had to give them like a narrated PowerPoint. Now, if, it were, if I were to design uh, something, I mean, I would kind of off the top of my head, figure out ways to increase uh, engagement online. Uh, at the moment, you know, you know, YouTube is great, right? Because once you watch a video, the following videos are all related, right? So once I watch a video of like student, uh, how to increase student engagement in an online classroom, both synchronous and asynchronous, YouTube recommends me like dozens of videos talking about those things. And uh, the people working in education have far, far um, more experience in this area uh, than, than we do as economists. Uh, I think what we can bring to the table is a much better, more credible analysis, but the, the ideas of what to do in terms of uh, how to increase student engagement, we can take from them and then kind of test whether um, it works uh, for our students or not. But uh, you're right, like in an environment where teaching has to take place online, I would guess students who are going to be uh, learning much better where they can uh, participate and actively engage, not just with the lecturer, by the way, uh, but also with, uh, with, with their classmates. Okay, thanks, Paloy, and, and thanks, Jeff. Um, any other question from Zoom participants? Let me just see. How about from Facebook? Well, yes. Oh, Randy. Hi, <laughs> Hi uh, Dr. Paloy. It's nice to see you online. It's good to see you. <laughs> so, uh, well, I just a question in the in the chat. No? Um, are the are the poll questions actually uh, graded? I mean, uh, are are they included in the marks? No. Well, how I think. Well, I did also some. I mean, Zoom has a poll feature, and the first time I've tried it. Um, I don't know if the results that, that you see in terms of why they don't affect um, the marks is that, that maybe, be, I don't know, I, I, I don't know what the questions in the poll are. When I did it, um, after that, ter uh, after that, uh, that, that uh, um, academic term of teaching, I was thinking whether I was doing the poll questions correct, um, because I it may also be that the poll questions might not be necessarily related to the, the questions in the final assessments. Uh, so that I don't know if that might be driving the results, but maybe uh, the way that, uh, well, I, I think we're seeing, well, my, my second question is, could you say that also the, uh, the, the significance of attendance might uh, be driven by the fact that this is a novel teaching method? So maybe uh, because students see that uh, this lecture classes as this, uh, as this um, uh, I mean, methodology. I mean, so students are maybe excited to, to try out that uh, polling feature. You know? so, so I don't know. Right. So let me address the first, uh, the second question first. Um, so you're right. I think um, we did mention that in the paper, in the sense that uh, you know students are a bit more engaged now, maybe because they are just trying out this new thing, right? And maybe this effect uh, dissipates after a semester or two, right? Uh, so that's that's true. We are unfortunately unable to test uh, whether that's the case. Um, all in we know is that for this semester, there's an increased uh, engagement. Um, but it could be, of course, driven by the novelty of the whole situation. Now, with respect to the MCQ questions at the start, um, they were designed to be um, like not graded. Um, so they're very low stakes. Um, they're not there to kind of be marked by, by the lecturer or be included in their final mark. Um, however, they were... Uh, related to, to the lecture materials of the previous week and of the same level of difficulty that they would get in, in the problem sets. Um, and 
what what we could have done, which unfortunately we did not do, is to actually see whether the questions that were tested in the uh, the real time polling, uh, whether students perform better in those types of questions in the final exam. Right. That's I think what we should have done. In hindsight is like really great, right? But uh, um, you know, if we had just matched those questions that we had at the start of the tutorial classes to like their final exams and see whether they did in fact do much better in those types of questions versus questions that were not polled at the start, um, that would have been super interesting. But um, no, they weren't, you know, they weren't graded. They were very low stakes. Um, it was just really to, for the tutor to have an idea of how to structure the tutorial class that would address those um, deficiencies. But yeah, could have been tested a little bit better, I agree. <laughs> Oh, thank, thanks, Randy. Thank you. Okay. Uh, by the way, good to see you also, Randy. Apparently, I know everybody here. <laughs> Are your classmates? <laughs> yes. And we were not paid, I think. <laughs> Any other questions from Zoom participants? Just unmute and show yourself. Do I see a hand raising? Uh, okay, Palois, while uh, others are still thinking. Um, I, my question is, um, you only tested the uh, one particular software, right? So I, I, but I just wonder because there are other softwares out, out there that does polling like Mentimeter. Randy said that there is a polling on Zoom. I wonder if you are going to do another experiment, whether this would be, you know, something, because it's also the design of the software that might affect learning of the students. So that's one yeah. question. Yes, please. Yeah, no, I, I so completely, I should have mentioned this at the, you know, when I was presenting it, but um, you, we use that software, um, mm -hmm. but the technique is uh, software independent, right? Okay. If, right, like, I mean, it's, it's real time polling. You could do that in Zoom. You could do that on, we use Moodle. I don't know if Ateneo uses Blackboard or Canvas, and but yeah. here we use Moodle. Um, and it's just a pedagogical technique. The software kind of like facilitates it a little bit, right? But if, you know, if if you didn't have that software, you could have like, you could distribute like flashcards to the students with A, B, C, D, right? And then you ask them the questions at the start of tutorial class and then they raise their, you know, the only, of course, it's not completely comparable because then it's not anonymous and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, you know, there's like influence of like, maybe they don't, they're too shy. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't want other students to see that they made a mistake and, and so on, right? But, but the technique itself um, is kind of like software independent. It's much more to do with um, the, the idea that we, we are getting students uh, involved in actively participating in, in the lecture. Now, whether that comes from, you know, flashcards uh, once you do on-campus teaching again or, or something else, then, you know, it's kind of uh, a minor, uh, a minor point. But you're right. Um, what is kind of like more interesting, I guess, is... Um, if we use other things that um, just learning catalytics facilitates, which like, so for example, like the think pair and share kind of situation is really interesting. If you have a huge lecture class and there is a fixed seating arrangement um, and then you ask a question and then you see on this map of like seating arrangements, who got the question right or wrong. And you know, with a press of a button, you know, the software assigns students to uh, another student so that they can have a discussion and then you can retest them on the same question and see whether they improve their outcomes or not. So that's kind of uh, unique to learning catalytics. And I think that would be interesting, but it's not something that is integral to, to what we did here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me just put on the other screen if there's any other question. Okay. I have one more. So student engagement, right? Um, if, 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 that's, if that polling or this software in, does increases student engagement, engagement is already a big thing. Now you mentioned earlier that um, there are people, especially among teachers and lecturers, right? Who are averse to change, right? So on the other side of the coin, how do you now, I mean the school administration, how do you encourage teachers to be innovative, especially when it comes to using technology, because it's one thing for students. These students, they're, they grew up, right, in the digital world, but not all teachers grew up, and they're averse to using even Zoom. So, you, you know, it, 
uh, how do you solve that? They have well, like, actually, I mean, I am actually uh, in charge of uh, transitioning the entire faculty here to uh, what is called a blended learning environment, um, which is, as you can imagine, is a bit of a headache um, because the diversity of competence in technology is really, you know, we're, most of us are economists here. The variance is high. <laughs> like the variance in technological competence is quite high. I'll give you an example. One of the, you know, old time lecturers here was I told him to copy paste a file right and, and if I asked you ma how you copy and paste you control c and you control v right this guy was opening and then save as like <laughs> where do I start it's open save as versus control c control v um, however <laughs> we kind of know that uh, w when it comes to uh, probation and promotion at our university, at least, uh, an integral, because we evaluate our faculty members on three pillars, sorry, on three pillars. One is uh, research, the other is teaching, and the other is what we call governance, or in other places, we call them service, right? Uh, that teaching pillar is important. Uh, and within that teaching pillar um, are student outcomes um, and student satisfaction. So teachers are evaluated here um, by, by the students and we keep track of, of that. Now, there are a lot of problems with that. You know, don't even get me started. I could give you another seminar on uh, the biases associated with teacher evaluations. Um, women in particular are severely, severely penalized by student evaluations. And if your department head does not take that into account, that's not a very good department head. Uh, so, you know, the, all of those things are taken into account. Um, and we kind of like make sure that the students are satisfied with, with our teaching. And sometimes that has to do with, with innovation, right? And so fair enough, if you don't want to be promoted for the rest of your life, then sure, right? But if you have any semblance of uh, career progression, then you might want to start thinking about um, uh, innovating in, in your teaching. Because I can tell you, you know, students are like, you know, it, these are like kids who like, I mean, they're not kids, but these are people who grew up with, with technology. Um, it's innate with them, right? They, they don't even know what a directory structure is on a, on a computer, right? That's to us, that's kind of like obvious. You know, there's the C drive and then all these other folders. No, what they have is just, oh, recent files, right? Uh, that's kind of like the world where they, they live in. And if you kind of don't meet them halfway a little bit, it's going to create a lot of uh, of conflict between the lecturer and, and the student. And maybe, you know, in Ateneo, maybe you can get away with the fact that, you know, lecturers are like gods and whatever. Um, here uh, with us, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of student-centric here um, and we have to cater to, to the demands of the student a little bit. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Palois. Um, we have students in Zoom. Do you have any thoughts on the presentation or on the discussion so far? We would like to hear from you. The student, tell me who are the shitty lecturers. Oh, it's a, oh sorry, that's recorded. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> My students are, are here. Anybody would like to represent the students? We have time for one more question. Anybody? Are you shy? It's okay. You can... I'll call on one of them. Give me a name. Give me a name. I'll call on one. I'm just kidding. Um. <laughs> uh, Luigi, Edward, Chanis, Isaiah, any comments, Abigail? Actually, let me ask them, like maybe whoever among the students can, can answer, right? I, I would like to know, like, what are some of the teaching uh, innovations that uh, some of your lecturers have done that you have found uh, quite useful for, for your learning? Abigail, would you like to answer that? Just your experience, from your experience? Um, okay, sure. I saw you but, first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to okay. put you on the spot. <laughs> um, I'm, wait, did I turn it Okay, I'll turn on my video. Um, I'm thinking right now. Um, well, what I like about what one of my lecturers did is that she created a transcript of a, of a recorded video lecture that she did. So it's just nice because after I listened to her lecture, um, I have something like I have notes already, so I don't have to uh, spend time taking down what she's saying, and I I can review what she already um, transcribed to us. Yeah, good. Uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. In fact, if okay. I can, 
add to that. Um, here uh, at our university, the, the transcripts are more or less uh, required. Um, so if we record a lecture, the, uh, the transcripts must be uploaded together with the lecture. And the reason for that um, is number one, you know, you kind of like it, right? But number two, for us, it's, a, it's an equity issue. Um, students with uh, very low internet bandwidth or students who have difficulty concentrating on a screen, um, they are uh, unfairly disadvantaged uh, if they don't have a, a transcript to, to look at. So as you can tell, um, at, at our institution, we, we really kind of acknowledge the diversity of student needs um, and reasonable adjustments that we try to accommodate as much as possible. So if you're a student, like, and you, you know, some of the students here can't look at the screen for a very long time, if they have a transcript, they'll print it out and that's it. They'll read it while they're taking, you know, a dump in the toilet or wherever, right? And they have like that transcript and that's fine. Um, so yeah, and I mean, that's a great, uh, great innovation. Okay, we have, thank you, Abigail. Uh, we have one more from, um, let me just call this person, I wish Joy Iparagire, would you like to share or ask a question yourself? You can unmute and show yourself, please. Hi, good morning. Hi. Yes. Hi, good morning. <laughs> good morning, ma'am. Good morning, good morning, Dr. Pilay. <laughs> okay, so in our... In my experience, so internet connectivity really is a big challenge to us and also to our students, especially in far-flung areas. So when we are giving the exams, the quizzes, so it cannot be returned on time. So if, for example, when we have our exams at 9, so the class schedule is 9 to 10. So, and then after that, some of the students, mom, we have an internet connectivity, can we have the... Can we extend the deadline? So sometimes we are giving, for example, the exam. So we are giving one day or two days for them to return so that there are, there are students who cannot easily access to internet. So that's why it's uh, sometimes the, the integrity of the exam can be, is a, is a, yeah. is a challenge for that because we all know the students one, one chat away, they can have their answer. So, it's a uh, how what will be the recommendations for this and also especially during the online the online discussion so not all can participate in the class in in the in our discussion so it's a uh, it's really a challenge no <laughs> so what will be your recommendations I, for this thank I acknowledge you. that thank you so much for for that question I, I completely acknowledge the the problems uh, again you know it's an equity issue um, and you might think oh you know he's in Australia everybody has internet in Australia Australia is a huge country and we have our catchment area at this university covers regional areas um, and so we also would you believe it have students that have internet connectivity problems um, but the first thing I would say is like the assessment tasks you have to um, kind of set aside this issue of like conducting simultaneous exams, uh, forget it. Exams are going to have to be take home. And in my case, my exams are open for one week and students can have the entire seven days to do the exam. Of course, are they going to be communicating with each other? Sure, absolutely. They're going to be talking to each other, right? As long as they don't write the same thing word for word, that's kind of fine with me, right? Um, there's just no way you can like see whether they are not talking to each other or not in this environment. And as soon as you accept that, then you can design better assessment tasks that will test whether they understand the material, even if they are allowed to, to talk to each other, right? I mean, a one week take home exam that they do online whenever they have internet within that one week period, I can guarantee you they are all texting each other. But that's fine, right? I can see who uh, will do well in the exam and who doesn't do well in the exam as long as they don't copy completely uh, word for word, that's fine. But if you're going to do a multiple choice exam in this environment, I mean, you know, maybe we try to make better questions, right? Maybe we try to make questions that are short answer, long answer, as opposed to a multiple choice exam, right? And we can innovate 
in, in the way we assess students. So assessment design is, uh, I think, should be considered part of our jobs, right? If you, this day and age, still doing multiple choice questions for a take-home exam, I mean, whose fault is it really, right? I don't think it's a student's fault if they're texting each other. Um, but also, it's kind of important to acknowledge the equity dimension. I'll give you like an example. Uh, we teach, uh, you know, like uh, ADF students here, like students who are from the uh, Australian Defense Force. So these are, you know, soldiers and so on. Uh, and, you know, they submit the assignments late, right? Why? Well, because they're in a submarine and they don't have access to internet because they have radio silence because they're patrolling the waters of, you know, near China or something, right? And I can't be like, oh, you submitted your assessment late, fail. I'm like... Maybe not, right? He was just patrolling in a submarine. Maybe I can just give him a few extra days to submit the assessment task, right? So there is some level of understanding of the kind of world we live in now and a little bit more uh, lenient in, in a lot of these things. Now, am I the final arbiter of what is reasonable and what isn't reasonable? I doubt it. Um, but that, those are my standards, right? I'm quite lenient um, in terms of these things. Um, now, another teacher might be a little bit more strict. Fair enough. We'll see. Okay, thanks. Uh, one last question. This is a very quick question on Facebook from Justin Wong. Um, question, by the way, did the students enjoy the new technique or did they feel like it was troublesome? No, they loved it, actually. Uh, I took out one um, uh, in the last, you know, one of the last few slides. Uh, they, they kind of like loved the, the new technology, which goes to Randy's point, right? Like maybe they just kind of, it's novel and it's cute, but then after a while they're like, yeah, whatever, Animal Crossing time. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. thank you. Okay, so at this point, it's already 11.06. So um, we have uh, actually gone over time for a few minutes, but thank you very much. Hello.